we've been studying together from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, and this week we've come to chapter 7 of the book of Romans. If you have a Bible, uh, please get it and turn to chapter 7 of the book of Romans so that uh, we can follow along together. You can check and make sure if I'm saying the right things and reading the right verses. Before we begin to look at chapter 7, it's a good idea for us to look at where we have come from. Uh, always in the book of Romans, as you get further along, it's important to sort of review where St. Paul has brought us from so that we understand what he's saying in context and so that we understand where it is uh, that we're going. Uh, so far, we have found that in chapter 3, verse 21 through 521, through the end of chapter 5, St. Paul is basically telling his uh, readers, his audience, that it is by faith that we are made righteous. We are not made righteous by doing good things because no matter how many good things we do, we can't do enough of them to really make up for all of the bad things that we do. And so God is uh, righteous in his judgment of us because of the things that we've done. However, he has mercy on us and he shows us mercy through his son, Jesus Christ, and it is by Jesus Christ that we're made righteous. Now that, that covers to the end of chapter five. In chapter 6, he, chapter 6 and chapter 7, he makes two therefores that are connected to that earlier part of the book. The first one is in chapter 6, therefore you are dead to sin because you are made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. Number one, you're dead to sin. And number two, in chapter 7, you are dead to the law. That is essentially the, the message of chapter 7. You are dead to the law. Now, uh, we have to look at that a little bit before we even get into the chapter. We have to try and figure out what it is that St. Paul is referring to when he talks about the law. It's important for us to do that, I think, as Christians because we can find ourselves sometimes thinking that we don't have anything to do with the law. And in fact, really when St. Paul talks about the law, most often he's talking about the Mosaic law, the law that was given in the Ten Commandments and developed from there that we have written in the first uh, five books of the Bible. This is the Mosaic law, the law given by Moses. And in parts of uh, St. Paul's writings, he will refer to the law and he refers to the law in that particular meaning. Now, what does that law do? What do the Ten Commandments do and what, what does the Levitical code do for us and so on and so forth? Well, basically it tells us what to do and what not to do what to do in order to obey God, in order to please God, in order to do what's right, and what not to do in order to avoid displeasing God, in order to avoid not obeying God, in order to avoid sin. That's the essence of the Mosaic Law. Now I would like to turn to another book, uh, the book of Galatians which is just after 1st and 2nd Corinthians, if, you're, uh, if you have your Bible with you. I'm looking at chapter 3, verse 19. Galatians 3, 19. If I can find it here, there we go. What purpose does the law serve? If we wonder what the law is all about, we can look right in St. Paul's writings, it's there. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That's Jesus Christ, right? And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Who's the mediator? Of course, it's Moses. That's why we call it the Mosaic Law. So the law was given because of the fact that human beings don't do what they should do. 
That's what he means. It was given because of transgressions. And it was given in order to help us to understand what it is that God wants us to do, how it is that God wants us to live. So we as Christians, when we read about the law in the writings of St. Paul, we shouldn't automatically think to ourselves, ah, that's something to do with the Jews. That's something to do with the first century Jews. We don't have anything to do with that. Because St. Paul himself, not only did Jesus say, uh, not one iota shall pass from the law until all is fulfilled, but also St. Paul says in chapter 7, I'm back in Romans, uh, chapter 7, verse 12, Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. So when St. Paul talks about the law, he is talking about the Mosaic Code, but he's talking about something that he regards very highly. The law is holy and just and good. Now, when we talk about the law in this way, the Mosaic Code, that's something that's written down. That's something that you can go to your uh, local library. Well, I don't know if you can go to your local library anymore, but you can go someplace and find a book and take it out and you can read what is written in the Mosaic Law. But there's another version. There's another version of that law and it is an unwritten version. I'm going to go back in chapter 2, chapter 2 of Romans still in the book of Romans, but we're going back to chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So there is a written law, that's the Mosaic Code, but there's also an unwritten law. Now, how, how are these interrelated? Well, what St. Paul is saying in chapter 2 is that uh, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments say, for instance, do not kill. And yet, if you've never heard of the Ten Commandments, you know it's not right to kill. You know that it's a sin to kill. Uh, even though you may not understand the concept of sin, you still know that it's not right. This is uh, what we call the moral argument. Sometimes people refer to this as a moral argument for the existence of God. And, and uh, basically that says that inside us we have a, a sense of something being right and other things being wrong. We can do something and we, we know that we feel good about that. We know that that is the right thing to do, say, providing for our families. And there are other things that we know are wrong and we know are contrary to uh, proper living, you know, something like killing or stealing. Now, these things, these uh, 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 moral code, this moral code is, uh, is present in every single culture that has ever lived on earth. There's a moral code. And this moral code then, uh, it has to be given from somewhere. This is the moral idea, uh, moral argument for the existence of God. And this is what St. Paul is saying too, that even if you've never read the Ten Commandments, you know that stealing is wrong and you know that killing is wrong and so on. So when he talks in Romans chapter 7 about freedom from the law, is he saying that we are in Jesus Christ free to do whatever we want. That that moral code that is inside us, that sense of right and wrong, that we no longer have to pay attention to that. You know, the funny thing is that there have been Christian communities in history who have believed that that was the case who have read this little part of scripture and said, well, we're free from the moral code, and so therefore they would live in such a way as to essentially have no things that they do that were wrong. 
course, none of those Christian communities exist today because what they thought was foolish. And it's uh, one more example of people taking a small part of Scripture and building an entire theology off of it. No, it is certainly not the case that we are to abandon the moral code. Obviously not. What it means that we are free from the law is that I no longer have to rely on my good behavior in order to win the favor of God. Without knowing about Jesus Christ, without knowing that God's mercy has been given to us in Him, we can feel like that's what we should do. I feel like there are things that I do that are right and things that I do that are wrong. And I might feel like, you know, if I do a lot of them right and a very few of them wrong, I'm going to make God feel good about me and love me and give me the things that I want. You know, many, many, many religions of the world have been based on this concept that if you do good and you avoid doing bad, you're going to win the favor of God or the gods or whatever force there is out there that, uh, that changes our lives and affects our lives. But look at chapter 7, verse 4. <clears throat> Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit for God. In other words, you are dead to the law and you are alive to Jesus Christ. That does not mean that the law stops having an effect on you. It only means that in order to be in favor with God, you do so through faith in Jesus Christ and not of the works of your, uh, your own works. All right. Having gone through that brief introduction, let's begin to look at chapter 7. We're going to have to look at it rather quickly. I'd like to read, I think, the first three verses because St. Paul is going to start with an analogy and his analogy is a little difficult to understand. It's an unusual analogy when it comes to uh, what it means to be dead to the law. I'm reading from chapter 7, verse 1. <clears throat> Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over ma a man as long as he lives? That makes sense, doesn't it? If you're dead, you don't have to pay attention to the law. It's only if you're living. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So in other words, if a woman is married, she uh, is bound to that person that she's married to. But if he dies, she's free. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Incidentally, this kind of imagery is used often in the New Testament, uh, and it, it refers to the individual Christian or the church as the bride of Christ and uh, Christ as the bridegroom. This is a, a major part of the Holy Week observances in the Orthodox Church, the bridegroom orthros, which are very, very beautiful, and, and use this imagery of how we are like the bride of Christ. In this case, <clears throat> it's, it's uh, the, the woman who is married to a man uh, that, and that represents the law. And that marriage ends because the law dies and she can link herself to another. Now, I wonder where he's going to go with this analogy. We understand that. He says that a woman is married and when her husband dies, she's free and she can marry another. Where's St. Paul going to go with this analogy? Well, verses 4 through 6. Let's look at those. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. I just read this verse, actually. That you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit for God. 
In other words, you were married to the law. You were under the authority of the law. But that authority has died, and now you are linked to another, and that is to Jesus Christ. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So, the wife is bound to the husband the way you are bound to the law. And in, in this case, I'm going to use the law as the moral code. You are bound by that thing that is inside you that tells you that there are certain things you do good and certain things you do bad. Now, that husband dies. Now, when, when he says that, he really again, doesn't say that the moral code dies within us, but we come to understand that the moral code is not salvific. By salvific, I mean that the moral code cannot save us, we cannot be good enough to warrant God's love. We cannot do anything to stop for our nature, our natural inclination towards sin. So the moral code is shown not to be able to save us. That's, I think, why in verses 4 through 6, St. Paul is really talking not necessarily about the old husband dying, but the wife dies to the old husband. What, she, what he's really saying is that you have come to understand that the moral code that is within you is not going to save you. And what does that mean? Well, then the wife marries another. We are free to be united to Christ, and we are free to rely on God's mercy to save us and not on our own goodness. That's a difficult thing. That's a very difficult thing to do. If you've been going along under your own steam, if you've been praying all the time and giving alms and tithing and, and memorizing your Bible and trying to be good to people, you've been doing all of those things for someone to come along and say to you, you know what, that's not going to save you. It's faith in Jesus Christ that's going to save you. Whew, that seems like, that seems a bit much. That seems that seems a little crazy because I want, I want to continue to get that feeling of having done enough to get God to love me. And this, this scripture is telling us, no, we can't do that. We unite ourselves to Jesus Christ and thereby we are saved. Well, I think for the rest of the, ver for the, rest of the chapter, St. Paul really begins to answer the question, in the minds of his, of his listeners, and we've talked about diatribe on other, uh, in other chapters, and we're going to be talking about it again. Diatribe is where St. Paul uh, anticipates a question that someone may ask him. They can't ask him. He's writing a letter, and he can't stop and wait or send the letter and wait for a question to come back or something like that. He has to go along and then he has to think to himself, what questions might they have in their mind? What issues might be raised? And then he goes ahead and writes the question and answers it. He's almost doing their questioning for them. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not on the contrary, and he goes on. So what the, the question really is for those people who are in his audience, for those people reading this letter, the question really is, what then of the moral code? What of the law? What of that sense that I, do I just abandon it? Do I do whatever I want to do and then ask for God's forgiveness? We dealt with that a little bit in chapter 6. Now here it is again. How do I deal with that? Well, number one, is that the law continues to live in me. And this is where St. Paul's analogy at the beginning breaks down a little bit. The husband does not die and get buried and go away. No, the law continues to live in you. Chapter 7, verse 22, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. 
So the law of God continues to live in you, continues to guide you. And why is that? If we don't need it anymore, if we believe in Jesus and He forgives of us of all our sins, why do I need to have that sense of right and wrong still in me? There's a very good answer to that question, and that's because we continue to sin. Even though we're forgiven by Christ and we are united to Christ Jesus, we fall away and we continue to sin. And it's that moral code within us that tells us, you know, you need to get back. And then we fall away. You know, you need to get back. Again and again and again. Chapter 7, verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in my skin, nothing good dwells. That's what St. Paul says. For the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Ah, this is not a great translation. I bet you have a better translation sitting on your lap right now. But what he's basically saying is, even though I am united to Christ, I continue to sin. I continue to sin. It, it, it continues to have control over me. The more I face it, the more it continues to seem to have me in its grip. And so consequently, the moral code needs to stay in me, not only to bring me to Christ that first time, but to bring me back again and again and again and again when I sin. Now that process, that process is a very frustrating process to be united to Christ and then to fall away. Come back, fall away. Come back and fall away. Chapter 7, verse 24, look at that. O oh, wretched man that I am. St. Paul is expressing this frustration that he has, that he can't seem to get away from the law of sin that is in him. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? St. Paul is talking about how, you know, it, it seems like when you're united to Christ, you feel like uh, so wonderful, so free. You think, I'm never going to sin again. And then it happens again. And you come back to Christ and you ask his forgiveness and you receive forgiveness and freedom and you think, I'm never going to sin again. And it happens again. I travel uh, some distance to go see my spiritual father. Uh, four times a year I try to make it to see him at a, at a monastery where he is, and I specifically go to see him to go to confession. I love to go to confession. I don't love uh, uh, the actual confession itself, but I love what happens afterwards. It's like I say to my wife, I don't love cutting the grass, but I love what it looks like when it's done. It's the same thing with confession. I don't like going. And the reason I don't like going is that I always, I always write things down. Because I find that when it comes to the actual time and you're standing there and there's another person next to you listening to what you say, sometimes your sins just pop out of your mind and you, and you say, you know, I haven't been that bad. I, I think that's a Satan working inside you. I think that's a, that's a power that leads you away from God. But I write down my sins. And you know what? I go and I... And, and I talk to the priest, he gives me ideas, we talk together, we, we, we face sin together, we rejoice in God's forgiveness together. And then I go away and I come back a couple months later, three months later or something like that, I've got the same sins written down. And I go away and I come back and I got the same ones. And I go away and I come back and I got the same ones. And you know, after a little while it becomes extremely frustrating. And you say to yourself, you know, I, I, I keep facing this particular problem and it keeps getting the best of me, you know. And, and my spiritual father is a wonderful man. He is able to help me with, this, with the frustration that I feel, the same thing that St. Paul is expressing here in chapter 7. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who is going to save me from this constant problem I have with sin. Well, well, uh, when we come back next week, we're going to be looking at chapter 8. Uh, St. Paul will give us the way that he has been satisfied in Jesus Christ. 
the way that his uh, inclination to sin is satisfied. I hope that you'll join us, and if you have an opportunity to, go ahead and read ahead a little bit. Look at chapter 8, because it's a beautiful chapter, and it tells us how it is that Jesus continues to save us even though we continue to sin. It's a beautiful thing. So read ahead if you would like to, and then join us again next week when we'll continue in our study of the book of Romans. And now, as St. Paul has said both to you and to me, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Econ's has always been uh, one of the centers of the church. We have different kind of services that we offer, uh, not only through the liturgy, like we say that we celebrate every day, but also through the work at the seminary that the monks have been doing since the inception of the seminary in 1938, when it was founded by Archbishop Arseni, the, the builder of the monastery. Also, the monks uh, also travel. Some of them do uh, give lectures and, and give retreats. Uh, for many years I traveled with the mission choir raising funds for the seminary. Um, also the monks are involved in um, different work of, of, of uh, kind of upkeep, keeping uh, our repositories and our museums uh, clean and uh, making sure that the icons are in good shape and that uh, we're kind of caretakers of all the treasures that St. Tikhon's has. There's so many different uh, kind of cultural and historical monuments that we house here at the, at the monastery. Um, that work is, is, is very difficult sometimes just to kind of the upkeep of the property. We have almost 300 acres. Um, it's not exclusively the monasteries, but uh, it's shared by the monastery and the seminary. So the upkeep of a couple hundred acres of um, land is, is very difficult and all the things that are housed um, thereon. Uh, monasticism uh, in general for the Orthodox Church is, is uh, at the forefront of the spiritual battle. Uh, it's the, uh, the front runner of, of the spiritual life in the Church. It kind of plows the way for the rest of uh, the people, the laity and the priests doing the work. The monastics are, are doing the battle on the spiritual level, uh, whereas sometimes the, the priests and the uh, laity do more of the, the physical uh, battling for the kingdom where they set up churches. Uh, Whereas a monk, uh, his, his entire work is, is consecrated to prayer. And it's through the prayers of the saints and through the monastics who offer um, their life and sacrifice to the Lord uh, that the Lord uh, bestows his benediction and his blessing upon the work that is done by everybody else. So really, uh, monasticism here is, is exemplified uh, through the liturgical life that we have here and through the daily life of prayer that each monastic uh, has in his own cell. Uh, the, the, the liturgy has been celebrated here almost daily since 1905, so for almost 105 years. Uh, the liturgy has been offered up and it, and it becomes a, really source, a real source of power. There's, there's such a kind of forward movement of strong, powerful spiritual energy that's, that's uh, uh, blessing and, and benefiting um, all America. Uh, this kind of power and strength that comes from the prayers here uh, is incalculable and it's inestimable. Uh, the, the value of it is hard to, to understand. Uh, but really when, when we uh, begin to understand it, we begin to uh, really kind of tap into the mystery of, of the spiritual world, which is, is present among us, but the uh, effects often are not uh, always seen immediately.